Hey everybody, my name is Rick for those who don't know me and uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a very long time since my last video and for good reason, for good reason because the last nine months I've been involved with uh, on a new project and, and I'm pretty thrilled to announce that we just released the definitive guide to Power Query Am, my first book. I wrote it with these awesome people, Greg Deckler and Melissa de Corte. Uh, the book is out now. It delves, it aims to be the definitive guide to Power Query M. So that means there's a lot of M code here, not just the user interface. It's like trying to let you know how everything works related to M. So I guess there's been a big, big gap in the market. And in the last nine months, we worked hard on it, tried to fill that gap so that people actually have a good resource for structured learning and, and how M works. And I, I figured to take up a recording here so, so you guys can know a little bit what's in the book. Well, this is the cover. This is the cover of the book that you can now find on Amazon, Unpacked, and uh, the major retailers sell it. And I figured we might go through the table of contents a little bit so I can tell you some of what, what's, what's in it and, and why we decided to structure it uh, like that. And the front, you can see that Brian Julius wrote the foreword. We are so appreciative at his works because he was involved in the project at first, but he had to cancel at some point. But the book wouldn't have been in the shape it is without Brian. He brought together the team. I dare to say that I would not have been part of this project without Brian. So there's, yeah, Brian, a big thank you. I really appreciate you. And uh, it's been amazing working with you and with the others. Now, I'd like to take you down to the table of contents and go through some of this. Um, so you know a bit about what, what to expect. When we started writing this book, we figured, of course, there is a lot of content out there, but to have the good learning experience so that you actually know from, from the base to a more advanced level M on, on how to get there, we figured a book should really come here to do that. So when you get started with the book, we decided to just start with an introduction to M. So you're going to learn for who it is, what it's for, what are the typical people that work with it. And we just basically explain the, the M language basics. So if you've worked with Power Query, you're, you're going to know some of this. Then once you get there to the next chapter, uh, we aim to introduce some more things like uh, we want to talk a bit about the, the user interface in Power Query, the formula bar, the ribbon. Even though it's, it's a book about the M language, the user interface remains a very important tool to generate that M code. Even experienced coders like myself, we often click buttons for, for us to generate the code. And then basically after that, we, we, we adjust the code, we add some things. So it's, it's really useful to know a bit about the UI as well. Then we continue with some basic operations, but nothing too crazy because it's just just a quick overview of what is M, how does it work in Power Query. Now we figure we might jump in after that into the M language, but before you get to work with your data, you need to get your data in in some way. So what we've decided on was that we need a chapter to show people like, hey, how how do I get the data into my uh, into my file? And for a lot of people, that can be an Excel file, a text file. It can be a connection to a database. That's a very common data source. Um, yeah, but it might also be a local file that you have in your computer or in SharePoint. So this chapter shows you several of the most common ways because there's hundreds of accessing data functions out there. But we try to show here on, on how the connect connecting works and that if you want to change certain options when connecting, that you can use a record for that as well. So this is all about getting your data in. And with that in place, we finally get to, we, we actually get to play with the M code values. And, and we start out with the fundamentals on, on M values, like what, what are the characteristics of dates and lists and numbers? And if you're working with those, um, what, what should you be careful for? Because each of those values, they have their own characteristics. And you might, for example, be able to combine a date and a time value to become a date time. But if you're, for example, working with null values, that's very particular. And if you add like a number value and a null together, you're usually getting null back. Now, in those situations, 
it's good to have a reference chapter so that you can just read up on the kind of values you're working with. And that's what this chapter is aiming. It explains the values, gives examples, and yeah, basically tells about its quirks. So there's 15 kinds of values. So have fun with this. And then, and then we show what operators work with them, uh, how you can build your first expressions in them. But we also talk about control structures like if, then, and else. Um, yeah, because for, for categorizing or for conditional logic, it helps to know how those expressions work. Then we also include enumerations and that wraps up the, the basic chapter of values. When we get to the next chapter, that's an interesting one, the one about data types. And that must have been one of the most, one of the hardest chapters to write. And when we just started with that, I remember having a discussion on data types. How important are those? Because if you would add a value to, let's say a column, but you don't define the data type. So let's say you add a number value to a column. That's all good and fine, but Power Query will still know that it's a number value in there. So we had a discussion on, let, let's make a statement that data types don't matter. That, that was the bold statement that we had to defend when writing the chapter. And then we figured like, wow, data types, there's a lot to it because it informs us what to expect in a column. Uh, but we're also going to need it for certain operations to know like, hey, if a value is of a particular type and we want to combine it with, let's say, text, we need to have some conversions in there. Well, long story short, it was a tough chapter. Uh, what, what we delve into, we explain to you the different kind of data types that are there, the type system in Power Query. We show a little bit more why it's important. You're going to get an overview of all the types available from abstract ones, nullable, primitive ones. And this is going to get fun because this is just a data types chapter, but this is going to come back in the structured values chapter, the functions, the custom function chapter. There's a lot going on. Then you're going to learn about data type conversion, the different methods. Uh, how can you automatically detect data types and what are the pitfalls when doing that? So that's all good fun. And here comes the tricky part. We're also going to include uh, some, some parts about facets and describing the types. Now, facets are not a data type by itself. A facet could, for example, be the currency type or an integer. And both of those belong to the number, the number values family, but they, it has a, some additional information about the data type. So they describe the data, uh, the, the data in an additional way. However, Facets are some of the, the most common reasons of why we get error when working with Power Query. So we're going to have a lot of issues here when ascribing data types. And the reason why you can get errors are, are laid out here as well. And those are very important. There's, whenever I get a question on errors, more than 70% of the time is, is these type of errors. So very, very fundamental chapter, important to read. Um, you're probably going to want to read the chapter a couple of times before you really get it. But then we get to the fun stuff, because once you're there, we're going to show a little bit more about structured values. So that's the lists, the records, the tables. And of course, we already delved into the basics of it when delving into data types and values. But these three are so important in the M language that we wanted to show you more on this. So how can you create those type of values? What can you best work with? Uh, what practical use cases make use of any of these values? And yeah, we're, we're going to show you a bit more on, on how that's going to help your M coding journey. So I think you're going to like this. So we do all of that for uh, lists. We do it for records and finally for tables as well. And after having these fundamentals in, we're actually quite happy to get you on to the real M challenges because now you know about the values, data types, and how to work with the different structures. Um, so, th so the fun is about to start. Chapter seven. Um, yeah, Greg did a really good job at looking at uh, the different environments so you can understand a little bit more about what the M language considers an environment. You're going to understand a term like closures, which I find a very difficult term at first. Uh, and he talks about metadata for a bit. And, and after you get there, 
we actually get to some practical uh, practical examples, some some coding challenges that you can use for your everyday work. So we're going to look at how you can transition to coding. Now, what that means is that for a lot of books out there, they use the user interface to solve your challenges. And you can do most of your challenges probably with the UI, let's say 60, 70%. But there are a lot of functions out there that don't use, uh, that they're not available in the UI that are never automatically generated, but that are very helpful though. So in this chapter, we cover quite a lot of these. And we, we first tell people like, well, if you're gonna move from the UI to coding, well, you're gonna wanna look a bit into drill down. Uh, we're gonna show you some tricks on how to do that. And with that base in place, we'll, we'll start with a topic on lists. And there's there's a range of the most important list functions that we have found that we're gonna gonna showcase with some examples. So that's about like list transform, list zip. We're gonna resize lists, filter lists. So all of these are basically list focused, and and these are super important because because lists are a way to provide a range of values, and you're gonna see them a lot. For example, they come back when you select a column or when you return to column names of a table. There's a lot going on with lists. So this, this part is gonna be very useful for that end. Then in the next section, we also go uh, delve into records. Uh, there's some techniques available here that show you how you can transform records, but also uh, you'll find that when you're, when you're working with your, your data, you sometimes have to reshape it. So you might have a table and you wanna transform that in a list of records. And it's just good to be aware that the, the, there's different kinds of techniques available because even though there are a lot of ways to, to solve a problem, you're only going to know as many ways as you, um, uh, you're only going to know the ways if you've ever seen them. And, and this is just really helpful in providing you with different, different functions available and different techniques for records. And, and we do the same for tables afterwards. Now, um, there's a, a lot of knowledge packed here, uh, but with this in place, we also want to introduce you to parameters and custom functions. And, and custom functions, that's also one of those topics that's really useful because let's, for example, say you have a lot of colleagues that just don't have the M language knowledge. They want to learn, they want to know, but they have just started. Knowing about custom functions allows you to incorporate logic that's more complex and just output it into a function. and and if your function is like easy enough, your colleagues are going to be able to work with it. No problem at all, but you're going to have to be able to build a function for them. And that's going to help to maintain it as well. Now, if you make a function, then you're going to have to know about parameters because if your function has input parameters, those parameters will be placed within your function code somewhere. So this chapter starts out with parameters. So you have an understanding of how to create those. And we're even showing you some techniques on how a query that includes parameters can be transformed into a function. Now, the benefit of that is that your function is then having a link to a query with parameters. And whenever you're gonna make a change to that query, it'll update your function. So that's why we start with parameters and move on to creating functions. Then the chapter moves on and explains like from, from the basics, like what is a function? How is it that the, each expression actually is a function? And well, once, once those basics are there, we're also gonna show you how you can include data types, make functions, uh, function argument optional. And, and the, you'll also find that there's a lot of pitfalls here. So if you, for example, have an input value that is not of a particular type, that could make sure that your function fails and you're not going to want that. So, so sometimes it can be good to enforce certain data types for it. Well, all that and more, all that good fun is available in the parameters and custom functions chapter. Now this book wouldn't be complete without uh, dealing with dates, times, and durations. So in this chapter, we also uh, tell you a little bit more about the characteristics of those values. So the basics were introduced earlier, but here you're going to learn a bit more on how you can create your own calendar, but also some more uncommon dates like Julian dates. We show you how you can work with that. Melissa de Corta has had a famous extended date table. We're, we're gonna cover it here as well and see how you can create those. And in the same fashion, we look at date time, time zones, durations. Those are all pretty useful to know. 
Then a topic that anybody is going to bump into at some point uh, is covered in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is a top is a chapter that focuses on, uh, for example, it starts with comparers. And a comparer is a function that allows you as the name suggests to compare values. And you might want to do that sometimes like uh, case sensitive, you might want to use different culture codes for this. So if you're going to compare a text value with special characters in Turkish, that might be very different from comparing them in English, because certain characters are not recognized in other languages. So we're, all, we're going to be delving here on how you can use those comparers. Uh, then we look at the equation criteria, which is uh, we, which you can find in certain functions. Uh, the same for replacers, there's table replace value, there is list replace value, but uh, depending on which of the options you choose, replace text or replace value, your replace operation will look either at the entire value or at part of it. And it will also replace either the entire value or part of it. Super important. Then Melissa has done a really great job at showing what you can use the combiner functions for as well. All of those work slightly different from each other, uh, but just having seen how those work and how those allow you to get values back together, for example, if you have a list of values, very useful. Splitters are basically the opposite. So if you have values that are together and you need to split them at certain, uh, at certain characters, for example, then the splitters are where you're going to have to look for. So you could, for example, have a, a text value that is without any spaces, but you might want to split them at each of the transitions between a capital and a lower letter. Well, that's what, for example, splitter split text by character transition can help with. Now, that's, that's a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, you might want to read through this from beginning to end, but I could also imagine that you, you get back to these areas if once they become relevant. Now, with all this in place, there, there's a lot of knowledge here. Uh, but we had to build up with all of that before getting to the next chapter, which is handling errors and debugging. Because errors are a topic that come back a lot. And you're going to need it if you're going to create custom functions. Um, you might create logic for a query where maybe unexpected values can come in. Uh, you might run into error messages that you're not sure about. Anyway, it doesn't matter which of the error scenarios you have, you need to know a little bit more on it. So in this chapter, we cover like, hey, what is an error? What happens when we run into an error? Does your query break? Does the query stay in a cell and your query can continue? Uh, there, there, there's some ground to cover there. Now, the most common errors are covered here. And you'll also find there is a short reference to the formula firewall which we will cover in depth as well later in this chapter. Uh, but the fun thing is that finally, after you learn about this, we have some projects stacked up for you to understand like, hey, uh, in these scenarios, we could actually use those. Uh, um, we, can, we can use those error handling techniques. So we provide a couple of projects and we're, we're sure you're going to love that. Then we get to uh, the more some of the more complex chapters as well. Chapter 13 covers iteration and recursion. Now, for those for those who uh, have read other M books, they usually skip out on this topic. And that often happens because either the, the, the authors find it too complex or unnecessary to cover. But we have found that for the more advanced scenarios, often it is list accumulate, list transform, li and uh, list generate that you will have to resort to. Therefore, we dedicated an entire chapter to this. Uh, it's going to start out with iteration. And, and what we tell here is that you need to keep things as easy as possible. So list transform is the easiest way to iterate. Now, that goes to say that actually a lot of functions in M, they already have iteration built in. For example, if you add a new column to a table, it's already doing that for each of the rows without you specifying it. So, so inherently to the M language, you'll already find iteration there. But this chapter focuses more on if you, on top of that, need some recursive techniques to go through a list or to, to build up 
uh, multiple function calls for an API, for example. That's that's what it focuses on. Now, then we, we, we basically include list accumulate, which as an advantage to list transform has that it has a memory. So you can have a transformation that you apply. And then the result of that transformation can go through the next iteration. And then you can apply another uh, transformation. And the result of that one also goes to the next uh, the next iteration. So that's what one of the differences between list transform and list accumulate is. And we're going to show lots of examples here so, so you know how to use it. Then finally, we also get to list generate. Uh, that's a pretty efficient function. It's fast and you can use it for stuff like, uh, like making requests to an API, creating a running total, um, creating a list of numbers or a list of dates for a date table. There's a lot of options there. And, um, and, and the chapter really tries to lay that out in an easy to understand way. Now, bear with me. None of this will, will actually be easy because the topic is pretty complex, but I think uh, you'll find that it, it, it delves into angles that you haven't seen before. Then we have a, a next section, which is about recursion, which uses the, the add operator. The, hash, the, uh, the add operator uh, basically allows you to call, uh, to define a function at first and then call itself after. Now we generally don't recommend this, but it's part of the M language and it can create some pretty elegant code. However, the pitfall is often that it's, it's very slow code. So we also give some performance consideration about using recursion and what you could use instead when you run into trouble. Now bear with me because we're at page 568 here. Uh, it's really a thick book. With all this knowledge in place, we now get to trouble some data patterns. So we're going to have a look on if your, if your data contains certain text patterns or characteristics and you want to extract certain values from it, what can you do to retrieve this? So we're delving into pattern matching. There are certain patterns and examples on how you can get prefixes, splitters, substitution, what you can do for regex. There's, there's a lot of stuff here. But, but it's, it's getting a little difficult here because all of the techniques you've learned so far, they're going to come back. Now, with all of that in place and all the good fun, we also get to a chapter called optimizing performance. Uh, I know from a lot of questions from you that this is something that you've been waiting for. So we delve into, uh, first of all, the most important optimization technique is query folding. So we cover quite a few options on query folding, what it means, how it works, and what you can do to make sure that it lasts as long as possible. You'll also learn about the new query plan, which is available in the new Power Query experience, um, how you can read that, and, and what techniques you can use to make sure that folding works as long as possible. Now, with the introduction of query folding, also comes the formula firewall. It's also called the privacy uh, formula firewall sometimes. And the reason is the formula firewall came because query folding brings a risk with it. So any of the query steps that you have can be translated into SQL. But what if you filter your queries with certain sensitive data like social ID numbers or bank ID, uh, like bank numbers? Uh, you, you risk that query folding translates that into a, a query and that your database administrator can read that. So the formula firewall came into existence to prevent data leakage. But here's the thing, the formula firewall is complex and many people don't know how to solve it. Well, this chapter is there to cover that. It's a good, uh, oh, it's almost 14 pages and it describes why Power Query used partitioning and the two different firewall errors you can get. Then we also show how you can uh, how you can basically resolve these with different strategies. <coughs> Finally, end of the chapter, we also show some techniques on how you can optimize your performance. So we uh, we we delve into different strategies. Um, we talk about buffering and streaming operations, and we look at data source considerations as well. And and then we 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 show some examples and their performance. Uh, like the performance timings of your query. And the good thing of this is there is a way to measure this using SQL Profiler. And the results of this are shown here in these tables. And you're going to learn about 
buffering values. You're going to learn about uh, more efficient functions. And it's, it's a significant increase of speed that we'll find out. But also uh, the different techniques that we use may or may not retrieve more data from your data source once you pick it up. Uh, all to be covered in this chapter. Okay, and then finally, we also have a chapter about enabling extensions. And that is very much about creating custom connectors. Because we know there is a lot of connectors out there in Power Query. So you can connect to your SharePoint, to Oracle, to a SQL database. There is probably MailChimp. You can connect to Google Analytics. But there might still be uh, connectors that don't exist. But there might be an API still. So what this chapter does, it shows you how you can create your own custom connector. And it does that by, uh, by showing how you can connect to Discord. This is a bit more of an advanced topic. So uh, bear with us while going through this. But on the other hand, if you know how to make your connector, it's actually pretty cool. And we'd love to see you experiment with your own APIs here too. So we hope you, uh, you manage to get to the end as well and go through it. That should really help out. And um, well, it's only the second week that the book is out. Um, we, we would love to hear from you what your thoughts are. But we, we strongly believe that this book is going to make a difference for the M community, for those who really want to learn M. And in the coming weeks, you can, uh, you can expect some more videos from us showcasing techniques that are also covered in the book so that you can, uh, so that you can improve your skills. Well, I hope you like that for now. And, um, yeah, you're, you're going to see more of this. If you want to already get started, the book is available on Amazon. You can get it in packed. I will put a link in the description as well. And it would mean the world to us if, uh, if you would have the trust to get the book and let us know what you think. Well, thanks for bearing with me and uh, I'll see you next time.